when the West came as a powerful and ag an aggressive force with a lot of new armaments, new kind of ideas and, and with a missionary instinct to, to uh, tell the world uh, what is good for them, uh, the Chinese didn't know how to respond because they had not encountered people like that before. So they were not prepared. And in so far as they've been successful for so long, they had become complacent about their own success. And when they were challenged in this very aggressive way by the West, they failed to respond adequately and therefore lost everything in the course of it. In only 30 years, the Chinese government has lifted almost half a billion people out of poverty, the equivalent of the entire population of South America. The Chinese economy, from the seventh in the world in 1970, became the second and is still rising faster than any other economy in the industrialized world. Thanks to the China price, technology goods became affordable beyond the developed world. Its thirst for resources created millions of jobs in dusty corners of the world otherwise long forgotten. At the turn of the millennium, it seems that every tabloid tries to predict the future of this economic miracle. But little is remembered of what the Chinese history textbooks still call the century of shame and humiliation. This program will explore the tumultuous interaction between China and the Western nations during the 19th century from a Western and a Chinese perspective. From our first encounters, we in the West only knew what we wanted from China, but never wondered what China wanted from us. For most of their history, they just wanted to be left alone. Now, for the first time, this is about to change, and this change will transform the world for the centuries to come. I think all civilizations before the modern era would go to autocracy over time. Most of the world followed that path. It is only the West that made an exception. For me, the big question is not why China didn't become modern. The big question is, why did the West develop so well? Such a small part of the world. Why? About 200 years before Christ, at the height of the Roman Empire, the man who was to become the first Chinese emperor, Qin Sha Huang, conquered and united the seven warring states, founding an empire bound to last for over 2,000 years. 
The first Emperor Qin introduced common coinage, a unified system of weights and measures, and even standardized the axles of carts traveling on over 6,000 kilometers of roads. China's civilization is both old and extraordinarily rich. If we look, for example, just at philosophy, Confucius is, a rough, is roughly a contemporary of the Buddha in India and Socrates in Greece, and was taking on, along with other thinkers at that time, enormous questions of how to order society, what are the roles of members of that society, what is the responsibility of governors. And many of the questions that they were addressing seem very contemporary to us today. If Christianity, Islam, and Judaism explored the relationship between man and the divine, Confucianism focused simply on how to order society. To put the world right in order, we first must put the nation in order. To put the nation in order, we must first put the family in order. To put the family in order, we must first cultivate our personal life. We must first set our hearts right. Having lived at a time when small states were constantly battling for territory, Confucius envisioned a future where a centralized government run by scholar administrators would strictly control the military. This line of thought gave rise to an imperial army designed mainly for defensive purposes and usually deployed not around the imperial court but in garrisons along the Great Wall. The Chinese, of course, are the folks who invent paper. We can also, of course, note that the Chinese invent the compass. We note that they invent gunpowder. In terms of selecting officials, the Chinese were far ahead of the West in trying to create a system of meritocracy, a, mer a meritocratic system, where they selected the bureaucrats based on what they knew rather than who they knew. By the 6th century, the ranks of the government administration became open to any Chinese citizen, provided he could pass a comprehensive examination and he possessed the five essential Confucian virtues – benevolence, righteousness, propriety, wisdom and trustworthiness. By this time, Europe was evolving in the opposite direction. The Roman Empire was disintegrating, giving birth to numerous small kingdoms, duchies and principalities, each run by its own monarch in control of his own army. Their administrations were run by the titled aristocracy, a system based on clan heredity and not at all on merit. If European monarchs ruled by divine right with unconditional powers over their subjects, a Chinese emperor needed the Mandate of Heaven, which was conditional and dependent on him maintaining the economic harmony and, even more importantly, the social harmony. Uh, in brief, I would simply say any co comparison between Christianity and Confucianism must face the fact that one believes in God and the other doesn't. So from that starting point, then how each person deals with the rest of the world uh, is influenced by those ideas. For example, in Christianity, the individual is thought to, be, to have a sense of um, fulfilling himself, being responsible for himself, uh, to God as an individual, whereas in the Chinese context, he primarily o owes his responsibilities to his family. Confucius believed that any member of society, not just the aristocracy and the clergy, could attain great virtues. While Christianity employed faith and prayer for the moral betterment of mankind, Confucianism believed in education, and this education was to take place within the family. Five social relationships defined the status and role of each member. Friend to friend, elder brother to younger brother, husband to wife, father to son,
were designed to prepare family members for the most important relationship in society, the relationship between subject and ruler. Those who in private life behave well towards their parents and elder brothers, in public life seldom show a disposition to resist the authority of their superiors. And for such men, the thought of starting a revolution has never occurred. Jia uh, means nation state. Guo means state, Jia means family. The two characters put together means nation state. And for centuries and centuries and centuries, the Chinese have been using this phrase. And automatically, in our subconsciousness, the two things are the same. The nation comes first, and the family the second. We think we are the subordinates, uh, a small, a uh, soldier on the grand chess. We could be easily mobilized and sacrificed, and that's good for the higher purpose of protecting the future of the nation. That's what you might call collectivism, uh, the beauty and ugliness of uh, collectivism. But that's true. There are two Confucianisms. One is the philosophy itself as it emerged in the 5th century BC. The other is the use of Confucius by imperial institutions to legitimize themselves. Um, the, the original Confucianism is basically a philosophy of self-cultivation. Now later on, these qualities uh, were used in a much more opportunistic and instrumental way to claim the obedience of passive subjects. Confucianism became an ideology to justify the autocratic hierarchical rule of a very self-centered and grandiose imperial bureaucracy. And the people down below uh, had very little uh, that they received from this imperial institution uh, by way of virtuous conduct. The Mandate of Heaven took a, a theory of virtue and converted it into a theory of political legitimacy. Uh, your legitimacy was ipso facto conferred by order. If you had an orderly realm, therefore political authority was legitimate. The minute it became disorderly and a dynasty was overthrown, clearly you've lost the mandate of heaven. Very opportunistic and very convenient for those who win. Our rulers understood early that politics are about brutality. If you're brutal enough, you can rule forever. The people knew they couldn't revolt, and the rulers would use any means to keep their rule. That's how they developed a very stable structure, the emperor system. Only a natural disaster would prompt a revolt that would change the dynasty. But then, the same system continued. If the imperial government was tolerant towards religion, it maintained a rigid social structure. At the top was the emperor, followed by the imperial scholar bureaucrats. Then came the landed gentry and small lot farmers. Artisans and manufacturers were also appreciated, but any innovative products had to meet government approval. Finally, at the lowest rung of society were the merchants, banned from government office, banned from riding horses, and at times even banned from wearing expensive clothes. Chinese inventions uh, are impressive and very early. Enormous invention, but not so much innovation of a technologically useful kind. Merchants were always regarded as a threat because they could accumulate money without being under the power of the uh, existing feudal establishment. Um, and without a, a, an entrepreneurial merchant class, 
the idea of developing wealth and innovating ways of converting inventions into useful technology um, for production, let's say, uh, never really happened. So, for example, gunpowder was used for fireworks. It was not used for explosive projectiles. Meanwhile, in an obscure corner of Europe, 25 English noblemen, at odds with a despotic monarch, forced King John of England to sign a document that would bind him by the same laws that applied to them. Magna Carta Libertatum, a 13th century document, introduced the West to the idea of government by consent, a government that would respect and protect the individual rights freedoms and property. No freeman shall be taken or imprisoned, or be deceased of his freehold or liberties or free customs, or be outlawed or exiled or any otherwise destroyed. Nor will we not pass upon him nor condemn him, but by lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. We will not deny or defer to any man either justice or right. The whole problem of individualism is very complicated in the history of China, and it's true that you don't get the kinds of assertions of the primacy of the individual that you get in some of the crucial Western texts. And certainly, if you're thinking in terms of political rights, of you know, how you get to constitutionalism, etc., cetera, um, China is not on a track to that without encountering the outside world. I mean, there are ways in which the state is checked, but they're not through claims of individual rights for the most part. There are certainly indigenous humanist traditions that allow you to make a case against you know, extreme violations of the person. So it's not as if China has no tradition of individual rights. But it doesn't have that same notion that nothing legitimately stands between individual and state, right? That I'm a citizen, I'm in a dialogue in a sense with my government, I have a claim as an individual. In China, you're much more likely to have a claim as a member of a community. And that does set you on a different path of political development. Collectivism is universal. Individualism is particular. Collectivism has been the dominant form of thought for the longest period of human history, while individualism is the recognition of a equality of moral worth among our people. That is, as individuals, our moral worthness is the same. Again, that originated from this religious idea that in, in front of God, we are equal. So probably in real life, we are not. And you're a billionaire, I'm just a, a penniless person. But Morally, I don't consider myself inferior to you. This is the fundamental feature of Western individualism. The Chinese don't even have a word for what we would consider individualism or liberty. The one Chinese dictionary I, I saw once said that um, privacy, for example, is the American uh, love of loneliness. <laughs> that was the definition of privacy. And same thing for liberty. They, they really don't have a good equivalent. Um, their institutions developed over a period of two millennia, um, and they were highly centralized politically. You had a, a very strong imperial court at the center, and then you had a very uh, widely distributed agrarian society at the base. And the two were only loosely connected uh, via uh, an imperial magistrate who was basically an autocrat within his own uh, domain. So no sense of participation, a very hierarchical society. Um, everyone knew exactly what their status was with respect to everyone else, and with highly dense populations, 
social order becomes more important than, for example, in the Wild West of the United States early days, when population was sparse, people had a lot of room, and if things got too crowded, you could always pack up your covered wagon and go over the next mountain range to a valley where you'd have plenty of fertile soil and sunshine. Like most traditional societies, the Chinese government focused really on just two questions, to maintain order and to live off of the productivity of the world's largest empire. If you look at the period of roughly the 15th century, China was sending expeditions of hundreds of ships into the Indian Ocean. They were visiting places in Southeast Asia, India, and even the coast of Africa. This is more than a century before the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. And if you took the largest of Columbus's ships, it would easily fit, along with two or three others, in the largest of these ships. Despite its political and economic stagnation, by the 15th century, China was still the largest, richest nation in the world. Quite opposite to his predecessors, who maintained a strictly defensive military, Emperor Chu Di, who ruled over 110 million Chinese, had built the largest ocean-going navy at that time. In May 1421, lightning struck the imperial palace, sparking a fire that destroyed half of the Forbidden City. By the time his admiral, Zhonghua, returned from abroad, Emperor Chu Di, thinking he'd lost the favor of heaven, had ceded the throne to his son. It was something unprecedented in the history of that time. And when Zhonghua returned to China, the Ming Emperor, was so worried that um, the power unleashed by this navigational uh, exploration might be used against China that he basically dismantled all 200 ships uh, and Zheng He died uh, without ever having really made much of a mark, permanent mark. And from that time on, the Chinese eschewed all outward communication with the world and simply lived within their own borders. China thought that we were the central kingdom in the universe. We were the center of the universe. So we welcome all other aliens to kowtow in front of the emperor in the Forbidden City. And we have been governed by this notion for centuries. So China refused to uh, go abroad in search of uh, raw materials and, and and we, we failed, we failed. Um, we failed to expand, not because uh, we were um, mean, we were nasty, uh, we were greedy, but because we were um, aristocratic, noble, um, but uh, noble in the wrong sense, because we thought we were the best, but we were not. Um, and we were given a bitter lesson and the estimation of the importance of trade, and the estimation of the importance of economic development. We paid so much attention and energy to education. It is absolutely true that the Chinese state could intervene at a certain moment and say, we're done with overseas exploration, call it off, stop it, and that you couldn't do the same thing in Europe, right? had Portugal decided to stop, the Netherlands or something would have, would have done it. From that point of view, yes, you have a real difference. What Zheng He was doing was mounting these enormous expeditions to a certain amount to see what was out there, but also to show the flag. What he wasn't doing, and I think this is really critical, is he was not blazing a trail for profit-seeking merchants. Fifty years after the death of Zhonghua, an Italian sea captain was also trying to assemble a fleet to explore the world. If Zhonghua was a civil servant of the Ming Emperor, Columbus was primarily an entrepreneur. 
As he looked for a government to finance his fleet, Columbus demanded, as payment for his services, one-tenth of all revenues that would come from the new colonies, and that he serve as governor of any territories discovered. His native Genoa turned him down, as did Venice and Portugal. The British monarch considered his proposal, but by the time he said yes, Columbus had already committed to Spain. What made them be discover the new world? What produced Columbus and all the um, sailors that went out? Now, then you go back to uh, the very aggressive world in which they all lived in. So all of them sharpening their wits, as it were, on having to kill and not be killed. And that went for hundreds of years. The war of religions, the war against the Muslims. The Christian world was actually trying to hold back an external enemy while at the same time fighting among themselves almost continuously for hundreds of years. And to go out and make the money, to have the money, to be, have better guns, to, be, to, to have an advantage over your next enemy, and so on, was all the people were engaged in. This did not happen in China. The country, China was peaceful. Yes, agriculture, there was, uh, there was the enemy on very far out frontier. The vast majority of the Chinese people lived peacefully. And the thing about warfare is, A, it's very expensive, and B, you've got to pay for it now, right? When the other army shows up, you can't say, hey, come back after the harvest and we'll have a fair fight, right? You've got to find a way of paying, of spending next year's revenue now in order to win wars, right? And that's where the European financial system in many ways comes from, right? It all really starts from the need to finance war. Faced with continuous war, European states developed the ability not only to tax their citizens, but also to borrow from them. Besides financing wars, now they could also pay for the building of merchant navies, infrastructure and public works. The government bond market led to the creation of the publicly traded corporation, where private investors were able to spread the risk and pool their resources. With property rights and a judicial system in place, land could be used as collateral in order to raise capital. For most of the last several centuries, whoever rules in Beijing looks out across their borders, and they don't see anybody of comparable size. And the other thing is that if you're as big as China, the way you meet a military crisis can be by mobilizing resources from across the empire and concentrating with them at the point of invasion. So in a sense, you gather resources across space, and that means you don't have to gather them across time. You don't have to spend future revenues. Chinese state until the mid-19th century basically doesn't borrow. Up until, let's say, the 19th century, given a world of relatively limited technological possibilities, that probably doesn't matter a whole heck of a lot. Then you get to the 19th century and a whole new set of investments are possible. Right? Once you can build railroads that require very, very large amounts of capital that's gonna have to wait several years for its returns, you want a different kind of financial system. You want a different kind of property rights. And what had worked very well for centuries suddenly doesn't work so well. During the 18th century, a number of English inventors developed the first steam engines. For the first time in history, man had made and was able to use a power source stronger and more reliable than the animals he'd used until then. The financial system allowed entrepreneurs to develop these inventions on a scale large enough to benefit all members of society. With affordable transportation, trade flourished and new territories were found and exploited. Feudalism was on the way out. Capitalism had arrived. The, the question of steam engines in China is very interesting. They pop up periodically over the centuries, and they're curiosities. They're sort of, you know, 
gee, this is cute. You know, you can make a jet of hot air. You can make it turn something, etc. cetera. Um, used for toys, basically. And they're not systematically developed. The Chinese paid an awful lot of attention to the specific skills of the craftsmanship. And uh, we paid so much attention to the application of such skills in, in, in crafting, for example, uh, the emperor's uh, chairs, the emperor's uh, beds, the emperor's uh, palaces. We, we didn't think deeply about how to benefit a social being, how to benefit uh, the spirituality, how to benefit the abstracts of sciences. China has lots and lots of coal. It's overwhelmingly in the wrong place. It's mostly in the far northwest. It's hundreds of landlocked miles away from the most commercially advanced parts of China. So what you get in the lower Yangtze, the richest part of China, is what one person calls a super light industrial economy. They're incredibly good at things like textile production, et cetera, et cetera, using very low energy demands. They get very good at saving energy. The British response is instead to find more energy which they find primarily in the form of coal, and which is, happens to be located in the perfect places for them. Right. It's very accessible to water transport. It's easy to get it to London. South England is very deforested from a very early date, so there's the demand, et cetera, et cetera. And coal, of course, changes the world. Finally, I think the rise of the West was a matter of luck. Several factors came into play at the same time. First, the struggle of English kings with the aristocracy delivered the first constitution. I think the rule of law was essential for the balance of power in the government. Secondly, the West accomplished a scientific revolution. Inventions were abundant all over the world, but only the West employed the scientific method. Westerners developed theories from their inventions and taught them in schools. Sure, there were plenty of Chinese inventions, but they were all done by chance, not by research. The scientific revolution resulted in the Industrial Revolution. For the first time in millennia, humanity didn't have to rely on agriculture alone. The development of industry created large urban populations. These new people developed a civic conscience by living in close proximity to each other. So that is how you got democracy. The Chinese had never looked outward beyond themselves, and I think that's a big key uh, to their falling behind the West. Pro part of the problem is the very cost of success. Uh, we have saw it in the Roman Empire, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. We've, we are seeing it now, I think, in the decline of American uh, empire. When you're the top of the heap, when you're a, a unipolar hegemon, you become used to having it your way. You become complacent, you become arrogant, uh, uh, you become exceptionalist, you believe that you are where you are because of some unique uh, qualities that you bear and that the rest of the world really wants to do it your way. Um, and that's true while you're, you know, for a time. But what goes up comes down. The notion of being the center stage or center of the universe is deeply rooted in our minds for centuries. We believe we should live in harmony instead of uh, hostility. And the, the notion of a harmony is based on the naive thinking that our neighbors are not so greedy and they are afraid of the emperor's power and strength in the central kingdom. But they are not. <laughs> they are, I mean, they are greedy. They are brutal. They colonialized Africa, Asia. Ki they killed uh, Indians in North America our naivety had been ruthlessly exploited by the Europeans.
To the extreme west are the red-haired and western foreigners, a fierce, violent lot, quite unlike other barbarians of the western islands. Among them are the English, the Islamists, the French, the Dutch, the Spaniards, and the Portuguese. These are very fierce nations. Their ships are strong and do not fear typhoons. Their natures are dark, dangerous, and inscrutable. Wherever they go, they spy around with view to seizing other people's lands. By the 18th century, Chinese emperors continued the policy of isolation, and any merchant who engaged in foreign trade was executed as a pirate. So great was their fear of the outside world that all Chinese living on the southern coast were moved inland, including those living on all southern islands. The only foreign trade allowed was restricted to the canton where an official market was organized and all foreign merchants had to transact business through official intermediaries. British merchants, frustrated with such restrictions, petitioned King George III to open China to trade. Lord McCartney led a delegation to the Beijing court, but before receiving him, Emperor Zhang Long declared, The celestial empire possesses all things in great abundance and lacks no products within its borders. There is therefore no need to import the manufacturers of outside barbarians in exchange for our own products. Uh, the Lord McCartney mission in the 1790s is a remarkable moment. At this time, China is able to dictate the terms. China is large, China is powerful. The Qianlong Emperor subsequently wrote a message to the British monarch saying, thank you for sending these gifts. Thank you for maintaining control over your territory. It's not necessary for you to send future gifts for we have all that we need, all that we require in great abundance. They move everybody inland from the coast. Um, it's a pretty brutal policy. It's something that you couldn't have pulled off in most of the world. Um, that's the attitude of the state, though. Very different from the attitude of the population, right? One of the reasons they had to move people in off the coast is because the people on the coast were perfectly happy to trade with foreigners. Because the things that he talks about, this says, you know, we don't need your you know, clock saying, we don't want this junk. There's actually an enormous craze for it among the wealthy elites of South China. It's very, very cool to have a Western cuckoo clock in the late 18th century if you're rich. The oligarchs within the dynasty were incredibly reactionary. They were the guardians of the Confucian faith. And here were the Westerners coming in with ideas that were totally unrelated to Confucian uh, notions of virtue and benevolence. Uh, they were saying knowledge is power, and they were saying that the only good um, curriculum in a school is one that teaches you how to solve current problems, as opposed to Confucian education, which consisted of memorizing to five 2,000-year-old classics uh, about good behavior. Emperor Jean Long died soon after meeting Lord McCartney. His successor, the Zhai Jing Emperor, eased the restrictions on trade. This would raise the taxes collected on imports. Banning them would earn nothing. Thus, a new revenue stream was created for the Beijing court. And in fact, imperial officials at Canton are under pressure to increase the volume of foreign trade because that revenue goes directly to the privy purse in Beijing. On the other hand, it's absolutely true that they see foreign trade as something that they can do without. And so if it seems to involve a security threat, the Qing state, they're perfectly willing to cut it off. Tea, silk, porcelains, a whole list of items were in grand demand in Europe and in the United States. 
Initially, the British were able to sell to China cotton that they were able to get in India, produce, turn into fabric, and then send to China. The Chinese, though, quite quickly developed a cotton industry of their own and no longer needed to purchase this British supplied cotton. Over time, the British demand for tea, for lacquerware, for a whole slew of products increased and they were running a huge trade deficit. Their ships would bring silver to China in exchange for these Chinese products. Many of these British traders were anxious to make money on both sides. They were anxious to make money selling things and not just importing them, not just buying them. China had an early experiment with paper money. It worked pretty well for a few centuries, and basically in the 1300s it's destroyed the way so many paper money experiments were destroyed. The government got in trouble and started printing like crazy, and after that nobody would trust it. After that, the Chinese economy, which is after all the largest in the world in this period, is gradually re-monetized with silver. And interestingly, China produces almost none of it. In fact, the best estimate is that of all the silver mined in the Americas, about a third of it winds up in China. Now, silver has a crucial function in Europe, too, because hard currency is what you pay mercenaries. And so it's not that there wasn't enough silver to pay the Chinese. There certainly was. It's that Parliament doesn't like decreasing their, their hard metals hoards. And so the British East India Company is under political pressure. Find something you can sell on a very, very large scale so that we don't have to ship so much silver to China. It's not an economic issue, it's perceived as a security issue. They hit upon a product that was available in India and in Turkey. The Americans imported opium from Turkey into China. And much more famously, the British imported opium from India into China. And initially, the size of the trade was quite small. But in the 1820s and 1830s, it accelerated dramatically. So dramatically that there was an imbalance in trade that was now in favor of Britain. Silver was leaving China in exchange for this opium. Opium does two things for the British. The first thing it does is it helps make their Indian colony profitable. It's a major source of revenue for that colony, which at that point is struggling. And that's pretty critical, especially because if you can get that by taxing an export, right, then essentially you're not asking any Indian people to pay the tax. It's politically much more palatable. The second thing it does is it enables them to pay for the tea that they're buying from China without shipping in huge amounts of silver. The government was losing control. And so it decided that it had, it had to act to block the importation of opium. First, the government adopted, uh, used propaganda, a just say no campaign. Don't use opium, it's bad for you. It's immoral. Second, it established sanitariums to try to clean up addicts, to provide an opportunity for addicts to escape their addiction. Third, it began to crack down and force addicts into collective responsibility units. The fourth measure was a crackdown on Chinese dealers. It was because all four of these actions failed to stem the problem that the Chinese government then took its fifth action, which was to address the foreign suppliers. And it did so 
first in a gentle way, saying, The ways of God are without partiality. It is not permissible to hurt one another in order to profit oneself. Is there any article from China that has done any harm to foreign countries? On the other hand, articles that come from outside to China can only be used as toys. We can take them or get by without them. There is, however, a treacherous class of barbarians that manufacture opium, smuggle it for sale, and deceive our foolish people in order to poison their bodies and derive profit therefrom. Not to smoke it yourselves, but yet to dare to prepare and sell it to the foolish masses of the Middle Kingdom. This is to protect one's own life while leading others to death. When that failed to stop the problem, then they seized first the traders, compelled the traders to give up their opium and destroyed the opium. And it was at that moment that the British traders sent an envoy back to London to lobby Parliament to authorize the British government to use military force to secure redress to secure payment for property. And in the British debate, everybody knew the discussion was about opium, but the law itself authorizing the British government to take action doesn't use the word opium. It speaks only of the property of these traders. But, say some extravagant people, the Chinese had the right of seizure, but not the power to enforce that and the inference they would wish us to draw from that is that it was the duty of British merchants to show respect for the laws and maritime rights of China. What, at the cost of two and a half million shillings? Very fit it is that such arrogant people should be brought to their senses, and notorious is it that in the eastern lands no appeal to their sense of justice will be made available which does not speak through their fears. By all means, thump them well. It's the only chance, it's the only logic that penetrates the fog of so conceited a people. The Chinese government they're actually pretty surprised that the British won't negotiate over it. Um, they, they don't get it. They, don't, they can't see how important it is, not to all of Britain, certainly, but to certain powerful British interests, especially those tied up with India. Um, and so they never really expect a war. They're not terribly well prepared for it. And they're not technologically prepared for it. We have uh, developed uh, a strategic thinking before the establishment of the first centralized kingdom, the Qing dynasty. Now, this, the essence of this diplomacy or strategy thinking is we use diplomacy to uh, conquer the remote enemies, but we use military force to bring our neighboring enemies to their knees. Having succeeded in defending themselves so well against others, they never really had any serious enemies for a long time. The Mongols were the only enemies in the end at the, it, from the 13th century and then eventually succeeded by the Manchus, who were all similar nomadic peoples from the north, horsemen. So the, although they had gunpowder, they had cannons, they had all those things, it was ne never necessary to do more than that. It was adequate for dealing with all the enemies. They had never met an enemy that really threatened them, and certainly never by sea. Never in the whole history of China did an enemy attack them by sea. So they were totally unprepared. 
So naval power, for example, is something that they, they had the capacity and they never developed it because they said, why, why, why do all that when you don't have any enemies coming by sea? From what they knew, there was nothing. In June 1840, a British expeditionary force of 16 warships with 4,000 marines left India to seek retribution for the destruction of the opium. The Chinese blockaded the entrance to the port of Guangzhou with chains. The British armada simply bypassed Guangzhou and occupied three other key ports, Hong Kong, Nianguo and Tianjin. In response, the Chinese called for a meeting in Guangzhou, agreed to cede Hong Kong to the British indefinitely and agreed to pay a large compensation for the destroyed opium. The British Crown didn't think this was enough, so in 1841 sent another, even larger expeditionary force of 10,000 men. Several strategic ports were occupied, including Shanghai and Nanjing. Faced with defeat, hundreds of Qing officers committed suicide. The British, having already undergone the Industrial Revolution, possessed much better weaponry, the capacity to support an expeditionary force of this sort. And they were able to land first in southern China and then to advance and threaten the capital. It took three years, but the British were able to compel the Chinese government to capitulate. Um, the decisive moments in the Opium War basically have to do with steamships. That the British are able to do something that the Qing never expected anyone could do, which is to sail upriver and get behind coastal forts that had all their guns pointed out that way. Um, once they could do that, they could threaten the Yangtze River and the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal is, as they called it, the throat of Beijing. It's the thing on which you ship southern rice up to the northern capital. Once the British can threaten that, the Chinese want to settle fast. And that's what they do. And in 1842, the Treaty of Nanjing was signed. And this treaty provided for First, the Chinese had to pay for the cost of the war, the cost incurred by the British. Second, it ceded the territory of Hong Kong to Britain in perpetuity. And third, it allowed for the opening of five coastal uh, zones to British traders. The most famous of these is, of course, Shanghai. It changed the relationship between the West and China in a really striking way. Quickly after that, the French were able to sign a treaty with the, with the Chinese that allowed for missionaries to enter China. And in 1845, the United States signed a treaty with China, getting all of the benefits that the British and French had already won as well as introducing a new idea, the idea of most favored nation status, which meant that whatever deals the Chinese would offer other foreign countries in subsequent agreements, the Americans would receive automatically as well. The Qing Dynasty like all the Chinese dynasties, was really a continental power. A few Europeans arrive by sea, defeat your very weak navy, take a few ports and open up for trade. Would you see that as a threat to your whole system? They didn't. So a wake-up call it should have been, but it was not understood in that way because they didn't see this as a long-term threat. It was only after the second Opium War in the 1860s that then they realized something was fundamentally wrong. These people are not just invading for a short while and causing some trouble on the coast and then going away. They are actually pressing inwards and they actually march into Beijing and they burned down the Summer Palace and that was serious. 
表达有点难，用英文。你想，你想用中文问还是用英文？对，用中,中文可以，当然，当然可以，随便说说没关系。啊，您中文讲得很棒哈。没问题，太客气。啊，你们是哪个国家的？呃，是美国人。是美国的。啊，你们怎么看待圆明园这块？那当然是觉得遗憾，因为这个毕竟是是西方国家，也是破坏这个地方，所以这个也是很难。我们不仅遗憾，而且非常的愤怒。说，看完之后非常愤怒，心里有有一种无名的怒火。我当时也愤怒。想想，当时为什么你们要侵略我们？难道就因为我们比较不好？不是美国，我是说啊，我是说，有八国联军或者是英法联军，但不是美国，美国还是比较好，一个非常好的一个国度。但是美国也也八国联军也也有。八国联军有美国啊，但是不是主导。相信你们肯定当时你当时我相信，如果你在的话，能阻止一切。<笑>确实就是这个意思。这是你你如果是没毁的话，我们现在看应该是金碧辉煌，非常好看的。对，跟在明朝的震撼，和现在这些好的这些不需要什么这个遗产，烂石头不是？嗯、呃，就是说，其实别管各地的各地的文明，它是属于一个世界的遗产。当时因为一种狭隘的民族主义，使得一个世界的遗产。化为灰烬了，所以现在就留给是一个世界的遗憾，不光是中国人的遗憾，这样子。嗯嗯。所以说不要再有战争。No war。嗯。嗯，好的，一起。嗯，说的非常好，谢谢啊，谢谢你们，谢谢。In 1856, off the coast of Guangdong, the Chinese Coast Guard seized a British merchant ship suspected of carrying contraband. Soon afterwards, the British and French joined forces and renewed the war against China. They demanded that the opium trade be legalized throughout China, that the Chinese Customs Office be put under their control, that tariffs on goods made in Europe be limited and that all Western missionaries be allowed to operate without hindrance. Frustrated with these demands, officials of the Qing dynasty arrested the Anglo-French delegation in Beijing. A few days later, 20 members of this delegation were tortured and executed by the Emperor's so-called Board of Punishments the British and French forces encountered little resistance, and after easily destroying the Tarpon forts on the High River, they stormed Beijing. The Qing government surrendered unconditionally and agreed with all the demands. However, Lord Elgin, the British High Commissioner to China, decided to strongly discourage the Chinese from ever executing diplomatic envoys again. 3,500 English and French troops with heavy artillery were ordered to surround the Summer Palace. In the early 18th century, the Chinese emperor invested better than a dozen years and huge, huge amounts of labor and money in erecting Yuan Mingyuan. This became the chief playground for the imperial family. One portion of this was designed by a foreign missionary to look like Versailles. In the middle of the 19th century, a combination of British and French forces took about a day and a half to destroy what had taken better than a dozen years, and huge amounts of labor and treasure to build. Laid waste to Yuan Mingyuan, looted it, and destroyed it, leaving a scar on the land and a scar in the Chinese psyche. After the devastating defeats and the humiliating setbacks, the emperors realized that we were weak, but, we, but they did not realize that we were corrupt because we didn't have a strong parliament. We didn't have uh, uh, the novel Hish 
who's a strong interest in protection of their vested interests would um, uh, urge them to take part in parliamentary elections and to elect those they, those they trust and to uh, formulate a mechanism of check and balance. Uh, so I think the Western democracy is very much motivated by the idea of protecting private ownership. Uh, we don't have the private ownership. I think the last 200 years of Chinese history has to do with the rise of the West. Unfortunately, all the Western powers went to China for economic purposes and none of them ever tried to reform her political system. And that is for good reason. It is easier to make quick profits in a country without the rule of law. I think the same is true today. Corporations go to China knowing that if you bribe officials, you can make anything happen. We were latecomers to democracy. I think latecomers always need international support in order to reform their system. We didn't get it. Starting in 1861, the British and French sign a treaty with the Qing Dynasty in which they get pretty much everything they want. And then they realize something, which is, wait a minute. We now have everything we want from these people. What if the dynasty fell? What a nuisance. We'd have to start all over again. We don't want to do that. It was much more practical for them to instead enter into what was called the cooperative policy, which was a policy of, let's try and keep the Qing on the throne, push them, make them implement the treaties, but not push them so hard that we topple them. The wake up call was indeed the Opium War. A group of scholars um, started to reflect upon whether we should uh, go to the West and fortunately, uh, those rulers who were defeated were able to pay the, the tuition fees for the first group of uh, young Chinese uh, students who were sent to the States to study advanced technologies. The coming of the West really accelerated the downfall of the Manchu dynasty. They were already having problems with peasant unrest beginning in the late 18th century, peasant rebellions. I mean huge ones, not small ones, millions and millions of people. And in that situation, the Chinese state was losing, the Manchu dynasty was losing sovereignty. The West was taking territory and taking concessions. Uh, the, the West was determining the terms of trade, uh, deciding how much tariff the Chinese could charge on the importation of goods, and Western machine-made goods were beginning to drive Chinese handmade goods out of existence. Um, and so you had a real deflation of imperial power, and their decision to send students abroad to learn how to make ships and, and cannons and railroads came too little too late. The Qing Dynasty became worried, but even then, they were worried, yes, they must learn from the West and fight back and defend the country, but they didn't think it was a threat to their civilization, to the cultural uh, underpinnings of, the, of that civilization. The political system seemed to be very stable. They had major rebellions within the country, 
and they beat them back one after the other. The Taiping rebels, the Muslim rebels, the, the having trouble with these Europeans coming by sea, but it did not really occur to them that this is ultimately something that would destroy the whole system. Why did they not wake up? Because they were so confident of their system. It's been there around for 2,000 years. Dealt with all our enemies, one way or the other. We will deal with this one as well. Until it was too late. And they only really, finally, woke up when they were defeated by the Japanese. That was incredible. A small country which they had despised and thought was not a problem. To, be, to actually lose to Japan. And why did the Japanese beat them? Because they actually learned from the West. American objectives change as America's position in the world changes. Right? So in the mid 19th century, we're a relatively weak power. And basically what we're doing for most of the 19th century is we're piggybacking on the British, which suits American interests as well because we're a strong commercial power and a weak military one at that point. And so we want the same things as other Westerners, right? We want to be able to trade. We want to be able to send in missionaries. If Britain opened China to trade, the United States proceeded to do the same thing for Japan. In 1852, Commodore Matthew Perry, leading four American battleships, sailed into Tokyo Bay. The fiercely isolationist Japanese were given an ultimatum open up trade, or trade will be opened by the cannon barrel. Fearing the Chinese fate of humiliation and defeat, the Japanese leadership embarked on the most radical reform since their recorded history. When China and Japan uh, encountered the West in the beginning in the early 19th century, their responses were entirely different because their societies had become different. The, the centralized empire of China was still intact with its Confucian orthodoxy, uh, which still wanted to control everything that came in and went out. Whereas in Japan, you had had the disintegration um, of empire and a series of feudal states, more like Europe, where the samurai were, became sort of these wandering merchants and entrepreneurs. Um, so that when the West came knocking on the Japanese door, they saw that there were things the Westerners had that they could use to make themselves more powerful, perhaps against their regional rivals within Japan. Um, and so they were able to adapt, whereas the Chinese, this old and rigid, ossified empire, when it was challenged by the coming of the West, rejected. The Meiji Restoration resulted in the first Japanese constitution, handed down by the emperor as a badge of civilization and enlightenment. While still ambiguous and at times self-contradictory, the first constitution guaranteed the individual the right to his property, the freedom of speech, assembly and association. The shogunate was dissolved as a governing institution. Political parties and a free press were established. Trade with the West flourished. By the end of the century, over a thousand miles of railroad was built, and Japan became the third largest steel producer in the world. The Japanese learned the Chinese language. They read the classics. They borrowed a lot of ideas from the Chinese initially, thousand odd years ago. But in fact, they were very independent of China. They never were subjugated by the Chinese. They never even paid tribute to the Chinese. They admired the Chinese a great deal. But their admiration for China was challenged when they found the Chinese defeated by the Europeans. And since they never really cared that much for China, they just from what they learned from China, their admiration for China was for China's success and prosperity. Once they saw the West defeat the Chinese, they, be, they paid attention. They say, if the West can beat, and those West just are some ships, and their countries way, way far away can come all that way and defeat the Chinese, there's something wrong with China. So we stop looking to China, stop admiring the Chinese, look at how these Westerners did it. If the Westerners can do it from that far away, 
we are so near, we can do it too. One aspect of the newly found Bunmei Keiko was the contempt for other Asian nations. Korea, at times called by the Japanese press a dagger pointed at the heart of Japan, became an obvious target. Rich in iron ore and coal, Korea has been part of the Chinese Empire since the 16th century. In 1894, the Chinese Secret Service assassinated Kim ok yun a Korean revolutionary with Japanese sympathies. Soon after, war erupted as both sides rushed to increase their troop numbers in the peninsula. The Chinese could only deploy 4,000 troops led by General Wan Shikai. They were no match for the better led and better armed Japanese army. The lethal problem that killed the last Fudu dynasty was the corruption. Uh, Director Cixi embezzled the funds for the Chinese Navy for the construction of a royal garden, uh, the Summer Palace. And she knew very well that we're going to have a, a, a war with the Japanese. Everybody at different levels, either in the Navy, in the Army, or in the government, was only loyal to his or her own vested interests instead of the future of the nation. At sea, the Chinese Navy found itself vastly outgunned. While Japan bought three new battleships from England during the 1870s, the Empress Dowager took the Chinese naval budget to build a new summer palace. In a matter of hours, the Chinese Navy was annihilated. Hundreds of Qing seamen found their death in the frigid waters as the Japanese Navy took no prisoners. Korean Empress Myung Seong was murdered by Japanese troops for siding with China. In a matter of years, the entire Korean Peninsula and Taiwan became the first Japanese colonies. This marked a new era for the Chinese state. From losing trade concessions and a few ports, now entire territories were torn apart in the country. The last Chinese dynasty had collapsed by 1911, resulting in further disintegration and decay. are dark, dangerous, and inscrutable. Wherever they go, they spy around with view to seizing other people's lands. Of all the island barbarians under heaven, the redhead barbarians, the island barbarians, and the Japanese are the three most deadly. There's nothing in Chinese history, anyway, to suggest that they would expand territorially. There's nothing again in Chinese history that they would attack anybody. They have fought, but mainly on their own frontiers. They have fought many, many times for reasons which may or may not be justified, but they have fought along their frontiers, but they've never gone beyond what was traditionally Chinese frontiers. Would they now do otherwise? I have no reason to believe that they would be so foolish as to do that. The world is different. There's no room for empires. Nobody's going to accept it. The world will not accept it, and they know it. They don't believe in regime change elsewhere. They don't believe in intervening in other people's affairs. I think they genuinely believe that because they are very concerned that other people should not intervene in their own affairs, and they want to keep the principle of state sovereignty is absolute. 那我觉得中国的落后实际上… I think it is the fault of the Chinese rulers. They brought upon our people pain and misery. Our governments, to the present day, never accepted a system that would limit their powers in order to benefit society. The treaties that the West imposed on us 
also benefited the ruling class. The victims were always the Chinese people. As the government always controlled the education, it was easy to create this blaming of the West for all of China's problems. That's where this national feeling of shame and humiliation is coming from. We want to we love peace. You've got to remember the Chinese are hopelessly peace-loving. We don't want to invade, we don't want to bully. We just want everybody to be happy the way we hope you expect us to be happy. But the way Chinese have been treated previously uh, was not very nice. It means we cannot forget history. That will serve as the impetus and incentive for us to move forward, to construct the Chinese economy, to resume our dignity with the re-emergence of this big power. And then we want to be treated as equals, not only in the United Nations Security Council or MF, but in almost all of the major world bodies. And I think China is welcome, because a dialogue instead of a confrontation is a way out for having a bright future.